Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 1028 for October 29th, 2023. Coming up in a few minutes. Watching Charlie and, and experiencing him, to be honest, is almost like it's allowed me to kind of take off my training wheels and, and, uh, and just get all the experience with it. There's a single Nelson brother in charge now at Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery in Nashville, Tennessee. Andy Nelson has taken on the responsibilities his brother Charlie had been doing before Charlie decided to leave the family business earlier this year. There's been a lot to unpack at Nelson's over the last few months, including a massive expansion of the distillery's hospitality space. And I'll sit down with Andy Nelson to talk about it all on this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, behind the label, and much more. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. How about a really great 12-year-old Scotch whiskey? I have a stellar recommendation coming up for you in just a minute. Spoiler alert, it's Dewar's 12-year-old. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. First, let's update a story we reported on last time around. The flooding in Middleton, Ireland last week that did extensive damage throughout the town, including the brand new Middleton Distillery Experience. The waters have receded at the visitor's center, and the extent of the damage is, well, extensive. The visitor's center opened on September 30th, but it'll now be closed until further notice. The deadline is coming up quickly for U.S. and European Union trade negotiators to hammer out a compromise on steel and aluminum tariffs. That's critical because unless a deal is reached by the end of this month, the EU will start the process of reimposing retaliatory tariffs on American whiskeys starting January 1st. During the three years the tariffs were in place between 2018 and 2021, American whiskey exports to Europe plummeted and have only now started to return to pre-tariff levels. Distilled Spirits Council CEO Chris Swanger is watching the talks closely. We continue to remain cautiously optimistic. Uh, obviously, uh, with the announcement late last Friday night uh, that the U.S. and the EU have failed to come to an, a, a broad agreement as it relates to the steel and aluminum uh, trade dispute, uh, both governments recognize that as of January 1st, tariffs on American whiskey by the EU could automatically go up by 50%. So, Highly alarmed, highly disappointed. We were hoping and anticipating that there could be some announcement of a continuation of a suspension of the tariffs uh, last Friday. But we know the U.S. government is working diligently, and we appreciate and thank the Biden administration for their efforts. There's a chance both sides could agree to extend the current suspension of the tariffs while talks continue. In other news, Wild Turkey is celebrating a milestone, the first time three generations have been represented on a bottle. Bruce Russell is Wild Turkey's associate blender, and his name appears on the bottle for Wild Turkey generations alongside his father, Eddie, and grandfather, Jimmy. All three Russells picked bourbons for the blend, and Eddie Russell is a proud father. It's so exciting for not only me, but Jimmy also to have a third generation coming along, uh, tasting whiskey, blending whiskey together with us. And uh, we actually did some that whiskey that Jimmy liked. We actually took him a few samples. He doesn't get to get in the office as much as he used to. Definitely what I love, but also stuff that he loves. And what's so great about it is where Jimmy and I sort of have a different taste profile. Bruce is a little closer to Jimmy, so it makes Jimmy happy to see what he picks out for the blend. The limited edition Generations is bottled at 60.4% ABV and will carry a recommended retail price of $450 a bottle. Buffalo Trace is coming out with a 25-year-old edition of Eagle Rare. It's the first release from Warehouse P, one of the distillery's two experimental warehouses. 
As you might expect, there's not a lot of it. Only 200 bottles will be available at a price tag of $10,000 each. Rabbit Hole Distillery is out with a limited edition release of its own. Seasong takes Rabbit Hole's high gold high rye double malt bourbon and finishes it in Caribbean rum casks. Only 2,176 bottles will be available at the distillery in Louisville and in a handful of other markets. The price is $50 a bottle. The James E. Pepper Distillery in Lexington, Kentucky, is out with a new five-year-old barrel-proof bourbon made with malted and unmalted rye. It comes in a vintage decanter replicating those the distillery used back in the 1940s. The single-barrel bottlings will retail for around $65 a bottle. And another celebrity is jumping into the whiskey business. Singer Michael Bublé's Fraser & Thompson is a blend of Canadian and American whiskeys blended and bottled at Heaven Hill. It gets its name from the Fraser & Thompson Rivers in British Columbia, where Bublé vacationed as a child. It'll sell for $29.99 a bottle. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Let's open up the calendar now and see what's happening around the world. Whiskey Live Beirut takes place November 8th through the 10th. Whiskey Fest New York is on the 9th. There's an E.H. Taylor Barrel Proof Bourbon Tasting in Lexington, Kentucky on the 9th, followed by the Big Bourbon Night on the 10th in Lexington. The sold-out Glasgow's Whiskey Festival is on the 11th. I'll be in Fredericton, New Brunswick for the New Brunswick Spirits Festival November 14th through the 18th. The Whiskey Exchange in London hosts its annual Whiskey of the Year tasting on the 15th. And the International Whiskey Festival is November 17th through the 19th at The Hague in the Netherlands. If you're organizing a whiskey event, let us know about it. We'll add it to the calendar at whiskeycast.com and in the WhiskeyCast community app. Gabriel here. The new Dewar's 12-year-old has been completely remastered to be richer, smoother, and more balanced. It's a total winner. It's double-aged in first-fill premium bourbon casks for greater depth and breadth of flavor with notes of apples, lemon zest, and spicy and floral notes with a long, smooth vanilla finish. The experts agree, too. It's winning awards like pros sink putts. In fact, Whiskey Cast's own Mark Gillespie gave it a 94-point rating, which is pretty amazing for a 12-year-old scotch. It's also earned a 94-point rating from Whiskey Advocate. That makes it their highest-rated 12-year-old Scotch whiskey. It's an excellent testament to the skill, craft, and refinement of the world's most awarded blended Scotch whiskey, Dewar's. Drink responsibly. Copyright 2023, Dewar's Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. Had the chance to visit Nashville for a couple of days this week and spend some time with the folks at Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. At one time, Charles Nelson owned Tennessee's largest distillery, and his great-great-great-grandsons Andy and Charlie resurrected the family business more than a decade ago. The distillery's in Nashville now, instead of the small town of Greenbrier, about an hour away and just went through a massive expansion of the distillery's hospitality space in keeping with Nashville's growing status as a tourist destination. I sat down with Andy Nelson for a few minutes during our visit. So since the last time we talked a few years ago, you guys have expanded the distillery. Tell me what you did. So yeah, the place is entirely unrecognizable, I think, even from my point of view, in uh, in a very good way. So we have expanded um, and renovated the current, uh, the old space, excuse me. So what we've done is 
added a 100 seat restaurant and 22 seat bar. Uh, we've expanded our gift shop mercantile area. We've sort of changed and expanded the tour path, um, and really just kind of upgraded all all the other facilities. Um, we've built new offices, which is hardly the sexiest thing to talk about or or see if you're not someone who works in those offices day to day. But I will tell you from personal experience, it's quite sexy to work in those new offices every day. Um, and then we've also added, so we had this Oak Room, the, an event space called the Oak Room. We've really upgraded that. It's got a nice new permanent bar in it now and um, and a stage area. The soundproofing's much better. It just feels a lot better in there, um, as well as added a couple new smaller kind of private event spaces, one being the Whiskey Garden, which uh, has a nice, beautiful living wall, a bunch of plants um, taking up the whole wall, and then some skylights, um, and it's just this beautiful, natural light kind of little area there seats i don't know 70 people or so for private events and then the that leads up into the cooper's club which is a new kind of private bar area and lounge that we've opened up um for you know uh, private events or things like that how much of the business is events now as opposed to distilling Gosh, percentage-wise, I don't know that I could give a percentage. It's not, I mean, it's not uh, 25% or anything like that. It's just that we're able now to have more events. Um, and frankly, I mean, last time, you know, before the before the renovation, we had our, our one event space. And looking at the difference between the old Oak Room versus the new, you know, I had my, in 2016, I had my wedding reception in the old Oak Room, and it was fantastic and beautiful and great. But it's it's kind of night and day difference now. And so, you know, the other thing is, honestly, we've only been open now since the renovation occurred for, I don't know, three months or so. So we have yet to really run through um, all that many events, but we're, we're getting back to it. I guess to answer your question, really hard to say. I don't know. 10% less, less than 10% probably of the full business. What was the impact of the renovation on your production? Are you able to produce more now? Well, the, the main thrust of the, the, the renovation was hospitality, and so that was really the focus. We, we have upgraded a lot of the production equipment, but we hadn't really added that much more new equipment. Now, we replaced our fermenters, for example, got some better cooling and heat exchange that helps us be more efficient with each batch, but we didn't add more distillation capacity. But with all the ancillary equipment being, um, being improved, we're able to go more easily into three shifts a day, potentially even even four, as opposed to what we've been doing is just two shifts a day, and it would have been tough to get to three. Um, and, and just each, you know, the cooling and all these things that that really cut a lot of time out of the process in the middle of it. Um, that's much improved. So while our distillation capacity isn't sort of on paper all that much improved, it's the efficiency within each run that'll that'll allow us to add more shifts per day. The other big change since we last talked is that your brother Charlie has now left the business. What does that mean for you? So, you know, in the past, Charlie had been kind of more the face of the brand and, and the business and everything. And I was kind of the, as I called myself, the factory troll. I mean, my, my title is currently still, you know, co-founder and head distiller, being that I'm more over production and operations. You know, but the truth is, over the years, I haven't really been, I haven't been on the floor distilling all that much. It's just been kind of more my purview. And, and, and I still do that. Um, and I love it. But I will also now be doing more of the customer and consumer facing events events um, and things like that, doing more traveling and being more kind of like the primary face of the brand. So um, I'm I'm a lot more, I'd say Charlie is much more naturally comfortable being that guy. And over the years, I've gotten a lot more comfortable and confident with it. So I'm, I'm quite excited now to kind of take that on, uh, on myself. Cause you know, it's been, it's been really good with both of us and, and, but it's gotten me kind of, uh, sort of watching Charlie and, and experiencing him to be honest is almost like it's allowed me to kind of take off my training wheels and, and, uh, and just get all the experience with it. So yeah, that's what I'll be doing mostly for the, for the foreseeable future. The other big change on the business side is that Constellation Brands now owns a piece of you guys. What has that brought to the table? Uh, so primarily, you know, a, a, a large handful of things. 
when we first did the did the deal with Constellation and got majority acquired, we were in. So this happened in May of uh, 2019, and at that time, I think we were in either 26 or 27 states with distribution. And pretty quickly, we got into all 50 states. So expanded distribution because they have, you know, a sales force of what two, three hundred people almost nationwide. And so that was a huge, a huge uh, change in our day to day business. Uh, and then, you know, on on the kind of behind the scenes side as uh, as sort of unknowable as that is to an everyday consumer things like um, sort of back office responsibilities um, such as payroll uh, HR things like that that were you know frankly probably a drag on on most small businesses because no one gets in a, into small business no one's an entrepreneur with the intent of you know having being the best HR person they can. That's not their job, but it's a part of it. And so having a full on professional HR department and, you know, uh, and I keep saying, thinking of marketing, marketing has been a huge, huge help in that respect too. But, um, uh, just payroll at accounting and things like that, that are, you know, there are things that we have to do, but it's nice to have people whose full on professions are just those things. And then on the, the bigger, more visible side would be, you know, they were just able to provide so many more resources to do this large build out and renovation expansion that we wouldn't have been able to do just on our own. Did it bother you to give up control? Yes and no. I mean, we know, you know, that's what we sign up for. We knew obviously going in that that's exactly, that's exactly what it, ha- what happens. But, you know, the fact is we didn't give up a hundred percent control and we were never going to do that. Um, and so that's, that makes a big difference. Um, not giving up a hundred percent control and we still have, you know, I'm, I'm still part of the business. And so, so that's a big part of it, but it, you know, it's kind of like going in eyes wide open, but you know, there, there are things, no matter what you're doing, um, there's pros and cons to it. So there's things that I fully expected. There's things that I didn't see coming or didn't expect, um, for both good and bad, um, in my you know personal experience, but it's all part of it. In my mind, it's, it's what we signed up for, whether we knew it or not. Um, but overall, I think we're in a, in a better place. Does it give you the ability to add more expressions and to do more different things? Yeah, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. So, like, one of the things that it's done is allowed us to sort of shift our lens in terms of business focus. And what I mean by that is when we go to all 50 states, that means that we have to provide you know, provide product to all 50 states. And therefore we have to focus a little bit more on our core SKUs and say, okay, we need to produce, you know, X amount of this because now our demand is effectively double what it was because we're in double the markets. Right. Um, and so there's, there's a little bit of that and it, it kind of, it does and it doesn't because now it's like, well, we have, we have to provide our core SKUs. And so there's in some ways less focus on the, um, one off or kind of specialty, what are the big specialty cask products or whatever gift shop only things. Um, now what that also does is it, you know, it does allow us to have better resources, uh, to do the R and D on these kind of small batch or one off rather ideas that we have. And so, you know, a little bit of both, I guess, to answer your question, you just came out with a rye, your first rye. Tell me about it. So this is Nelson brothers rye. Um, it is, it is, I believe it's, it's the first product that is wholly distilled at our, I dare call them our, our, uh, partners, our partner distillery, uh, Bardstown Bourbon Company in Bardstown, Kentucky. So really, really proud of this. So it's 64% rye, 30% corn, and 6% malted barley. Um, one of the things that I love about it, and it's about six years old, five and six-year-old whiskey in there. Um, one of the things I love about it is that 64% rye mash bill is, you know, I know that in the recent past, say, 10, 12 years, there have been so many, like, rye whiskeys that are super, super high in the 90s, uh, 90s percent sense of uh, of rye in the mash bill and this being in the mid 60s i love that it's 
it's a little bit of a different expression of a rye where it's a little in the middle between a bourbon and a rye while still being a proper rye whiskey. And so there are things about uh, certain uh, specifically in my for my palate. Some of the things that I really love about rye whiskeys, uh, some of them are like a spearmint note or kind of minty menthol kind of a things. And this has some of that spearmint to me, but it also adds these um, almost juicy kind of fruit notes that I don't get in a lot of other super high rye content rye whiskeys. You mentioned Bardstown Bourbon Company. You're also working with MGP still and with Tennessee Distilling. What does that give you in terms of flexibility and a sort of a palette to create with? Yeah, my the way that I think of and look at the sources of spirit that we get, or frankly that, that anyone gets, my... My view on that is I see the barrel inventory that we have and the sources from where, from which our barrel inventory comes. I see that as our spice rack. And so the more, uh, I'll call it for lack of a better term, the more exotic and varied, um, our source is, or the, the mash bill may be, or the, uh, the cooperage will say all these different variables, the, the more variation we have in all of those things, the the more exotic the spice rack can get and the more varied it can get and so therefore it's like there's the color palette analogy as well where it's the more colors you have on your palette the more sort of base ingredients you have to add to the mix and make a more complex final flavor profile or painting or product you know if that makes sense it sounds to me like you don't ever plan to produce 100 percent of your own distillate in your distillery well that was our plan you know, at the beginning of the business, we, uh, we never at very first, I mean, 10, 12, 15 years ago, we never knew at that point that sourcing was a thing that would certainly become, or frankly, that was so common and has become so ubiquitous. And so it was our plan to eventually move away from sourcing and build our own much bigger distillery. Well, in the ensuing years, we've now found that not only is sourcing so common, but it's a huge advantage in just the way that I described, where I see it as, you know, having our own distillate, which obviously we have now. I mean, we've got whiskey now that's nine years old at this point of our own distillate. But having um, limiting ourselves to only that which comes off our own still, to me, is uh, both the most exciting thing in the world, but also can add a limiting factor to it when you when you think about all the other sources and all the other places that produce whiskey of such different character, you know. And so, uh, my my opinion of it has kind of flipped. And for our business specifically, I think that it's a lot. I mean, never say never, but. From my business in particular, I find it more advantageous to, to have sourcing available. Um, and, you know, we will have products over time that, that are purely our own distillate. Uh, I'm definitely not saying that all of our products will always contain some sourced whiskey in it. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of all of it is that you can bring whiskey from everywhere and anywhere. Um, and the different blends are, are what make each product unique. And so something that's purely our own distillate 100%. You know, that's going to be a lot different than anything that we have with source whiskey in it, if that makes sense. Your great-great-grandfather founded the original Greenbrier Distillery back in 1870. What do you think he'd say if he saw you guys now? Well, I <laughs> I like to think that he's quite proud of us. I mean, you know, he built his business in such a different world in a different time and different day. But, you know, some of the things that I'm most proud of don't necessarily even have to do with the whiskey in the bottle. Of course, I'm very proud of that. It's got my name on it, and it's the thing that has given me such an identity just in my own life uh, and kind of something to ground myself and tether myself to. But one of the things that I'm most proud of from looking back at research of, of Charles Nelson from back in the day was more of the cultural um, aspect of his life and his, you know... <sighs> His wife, my triple great-grandmother, Louisa, was one of the first women to run a commercial distillery, at least in the state of Tennessee. And she ran the largest distillery in the state before Prohibition, before she had the right to even vote. And things like this that, you know, were so uncommon back in the day and in a way that so many would be, you know, kind of scoff at. Like, oh, a woman running this distillery. Who does she think she is? That's a kind of thing that... Um, 
that's really the pioneering spirit that I'm very proud of. And, you know, today, for example, I mean, we have probably, you know, we definitely have more women in management roles here at our distillery than men. Um, so in that respect, there's something to be proud of. And it's those things that are kind of cultural aspects to the business that make me sort of feel better and more proud than even, you know, what we put in the bottle. Thanks to Andy Nelson and all of the folks at Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery for their hospitality this week. Full disclosure, I was a guest of the distillery as part of a press trip, but full editorial control of this episode remains with WhiskeyCast. Finally, a correction, one that I'm embarrassed to admit. Two weeks ago, we did a blending segment with the team at Widow Jane Distillery, and I kept referring to the head blender as Sierra Jevramov. It's actually Sienna, and... I'm sorry, Sienna. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the new Nelson Brothers Rye Whiskey. As Andy said during our conversation, it's distilled at Bardstown Bourbon Company and bottled at 46.25% ABV. The nose has touches of baking spices, toasted oak, honey, and vanilla. The taste has spicy notes of cinnamon, allspice, and black pepper that fade slowly to reveal honey, butterscotch, and toasted oak, while the finish is long, spicy, and bold. I'm scoring the Nelson Brothers Rye Whiskey a 93. Now, Nelson Brothers is the new name for what they used to call Bell Mead, and it's the name all of their sourced whiskeys are being sold under. Like the Nelson Brothers Black Briar, it's finished in Imperial Stout beer casks and bottled at 54.9% ABV. The nose is full of oatmeal with honey, vanilla, and a soft oakiness. The taste has notes of chocolate candies, subtle spices, a hint of hops, and oak tannins. The finish is long with lingering spices and a touch of stout, and I'm scoring the Nelson Brothers Black Briar Whiskey a 91. Got to catch up with Ashley and Colby Frey of Frey Ranch this week and tasted their farm strength uncut bourbon. It's bottled at 61% ABV and the nose has touches of toasted marshmallow, hints of cinnamon and nutmeg, honey and vanilla beans. The taste has a nice balance of sweetness and spice with vanilla buttercream frosting, cloves, stone fruits and a touch of orange peel. The finish is long with charred oak and chocolate covered cherries. I'm scoring the Frey Ranch Farm Strength Bourbon a 93. And finally, Balconis Distilling in Texas is celebrating its 15th anniversary with the new Cataleja single malt. It's finished in vintage sherry bodega casks from Spain with four different types of sherry casks in the final blend, and it's bottled at 59.8% ABV. The nose has touches of dark fruits, cinnamon, a hint of baking spices, grilled pineapple, honey, and black cherries. The taste is bold and thick with cayenne pepper and cinnamon, grilled pineapple, figs, dates, cherries, and a hint of paprika. The finish is long and spicy with dark fruits and black cherries. And I'm scoring the Balcones Cataleja Single Malt from Texas, a 93. We'll have more on the Balcones 15th anniversary next time around. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 3,600 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm -hmm. Bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, Okay, it's not the longest list, but... The Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition only strengthens the bond. Finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky Oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the Whiskey Cast community app and see what people are talking about this week. Our community segment is brought to you by Waterford Whiskey. 
Our pal Chris Ratcliffe started an interesting conversation with this post. What is your sweet spot or upper limit on ABV? I'll preface this by saying that some whiskeys wear their proof better than others, but I was going between the Jack Daniels Single Barrel Barrel Strength, which is a silly name, J.D. needs a proofreader on staff, and the standard single barrel at 45%. The barrel strength was too high for me, all fire and fury and lacking the more subtle notes, while the 45% could have done with a little more pep. Where is your sweet spot or limit? The Tracer Bullet responded with this. I don't have a set limit. As you stated, some whiskeys wear their proof better than others. I think you need to try it and see how it handles the higher ABV. If you set a limit, you could miss out on some good ones. My brother-in-law has a limit and has missed out on quite a few phenomenal releases because he insists at a certain ABV, the whiskey will be too hot. In parentheses, you gotta try it, bro. And Alexander replied with this, I think it depends on the quality of the whiskey. I've had 40% whiskeys that are harsh and ethanol forward. On the flip side, I've had 65% plus ABV whiskeys that don't drink anywhere near their ABV. Generally, I look for higher ABVs if they're not too expensive. Luckily, you can get high ABV bourbon and Tennessee whiskey relatively cheaply near me. And Peter Sprunger added this comment. Hi, Chris. Going to agree with the chorus here that it depends on the whiskey. Some high ABVs drink low and some low ABVs drink hot. Recently, I did some statistical analysis on my personal ratings and found a very low correlation between my rating and the strength. Sometimes the strength wasn't statistically significant. Those are just a few of the comments on the WhiskeyCast community app this week. If you'd like to join the conversation, download the free app from the Apple or Google app stores and jump right in. You'll also find our new interactive course slash ebook on the craft and adventure of whiskey there, too. Of course, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, X, and Threads at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Our community segment is presented by Waterford Whiskey, where they explore the frontiers of natural flavor one farm at a time to create unique Irish whiskeys. Visit them on the web at WaterfordWhiskey.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. Texas is known for its hot, dry climate and high angels share, and the state's distillers have tried to fight the battle between high evaporation rates and the desire to age whiskeys for as long as possible. One solution? Switch to larger barrels. The standard American bourbon barrel holds around 50 gallons or 200 liters of whiskey when it's filled. Robert Licorice of Iron Root Republic Distilling is one of those distillers who's switched to using barrels that hold a few more gallons, or 20 to 40 more liters, and it has made an interesting difference. After going over to France and coming back and talking with the guys at Balcones and using it now for four years, what we've found is that the extraction rates are slowed down uh, quite a bit. You have more surface area on the inside of the barrels. And our overall evaporation rate from a 200 liter cask, the standard 53s, has dropped from anywhere between 9 to 11 percent uh, angel share a year down to closer to 6 to 7 percent. So it's been significantly reduced just with a slight increase of barrel on barrel size. And this sort of dispels that myth that smaller barrels mature faster. Yeah, I would say smaller barrels extract faster, which the at, at some level you get oak in at an earlier stage in development, but definitely doesn't make it age faster, for sure. At the extreme end, Balconis has started using custom-made 600 and 700 liter barrels to mature some of its whiskeys, and has been able to cut the Angel's share even more, down to 3 or 4% a year. We'll have more on that next time around. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just get in touch with us. That's all for this edition of WhiskeyCast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the Whiskey Photo of the Week, and, of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on X, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast, 
or you can use the new Whiskey Cast community app. Download it today from the Apple or Google App Stores. Our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Find the new Dewar's 12-year-old and discover what all the awards are about. You can toast and thank me later. From Dewar's, the world's most awarded blend of Scotch whiskey. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever wondered where Redbreast got its name? Well, let's go back to 1912 and be glad our bird-watching founder didn't spot the bar-tailed godwit that day. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2023, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.